He was known to have killed, for sure, two young boys, but suspected of kidnapping and murdering three other boys. But if he knew where those three boys were, he took his secrets to the grave. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of Randy Lawfer. Viewer discretion is advised. Randy Lawfer was born on June 19, 1972, and he lived his entire life in the Clare County, Michigan area with his family. I don't have a ton of background information on him, and this is primarily because he was only 15 years old when this case occurred, so he wasn't really given much of an opportunity to live a full life. But Randy Lawfer was described as a kid who was well on his way to a very good future. He was well liked. He was popular with a lot of friends. He was your typical kid. He liked to get on his bike, ride around the neighborhood, play with the neighborhood kids. He was athletic. He liked to play sports. Randy also had a very big affection for the circus. Uh, his mom would say that he just loved everything about it. He loved the smells of the circus. He loved the sounds. And he especially loved clowns, which which is unusual because nobody should love clowns because clowns are terrifying, as we all know. But Randy would actually paint his face up and dress up like a, a clown and go to these circuses, and he just loved it. He had he had a good time with it. It was September 15th, 1987. 15-year-old Randy had just gotten off of school that day. Randy's sister, Candy, well, they were supposed to both get on... Well, normally, they both got on the school bus to go back to their house, but... She noticed that day Randy had instead cut across the school's parking lot and began walking the opposite direction. This is because he had a planned sleepover at a friend's house that night, so she didn't really think anything of it. The following day, the school that Randy attended gave Randy's parents a phone call saying, hey, Randy's not in school, do you know where he is? And they're like, well, that's unusual. He slept over at a friend's house and he should be there, but he wasn't. Randy was someone who I guess he would typically kind of, if he was like feeling upset about something, he would maybe ditch his plans and go off on his own somewhere. And his family knew that. And so maybe that's just what he was doing. So they weren't like in immediate, oh my God, he's dead mode. It was just like, okay, he'll come home here very, very shortly, I'm sure. But he didn't. The family starts calling other relatives in the area. They start calling all of Randy's friends. They reach out to people at the school that knew Randy. Nobody had seen him. Nobody had heard from him. He did not go to his friend's house for that sleepover. He was a no-show, even though he was supposed to be there. The parents call the Clare County Sheriff's Department to report 15-year-old Randy is missing. The investigators learned that Randy had been upset very recently at his dad because his dad had said he wasn't going to be taking him to this hunter safety class, but that Randy really wanted to go to. And so there was this suspicion that he got mad at that and maybe just ran off to the woods to kind of like collect himself. And so everyone kind of at first considered him a runaway. But after searching the woods, they didn't find him anywhere. Randy's mom kind of had this sort of last ditch, like, oh, you know, hope thing of, well, the circus was in town when he disappeared, but now it's not. Maybe, just maybe, Randy finally said, I'm gonna join the circus, because actually this was something that happened from time to time. There have been reports of kids who ended up leaving with a circus to be found alive. And so the investigators looked down this path. They kind of tracked down the circus that had been in town. They went and talked to everyone. They searched wherever the circus was now. No sign of Randy. None of these people had seen him. They showed pictures of Randy, but he wasn't there. So as police are investigating this, they do come across a witness who says they saw Randy the day he would have disappeared, and they knew for a fact it was Randy, um, but Randy was seen in the passenger seat of a van, and the driver of that van was an adult male that the witness did not recognize. He also did not recognize the van itself, but Randy seemed to be in good spirits. He was actually waving at this witness because he knew the witness, but then the witness saw the van drive south 
south, which would have been the direction of out of town. That is the last time that they ever found of anyone ever seeing Randy alive again. They tried to track down this fan, but nobody seemed to recognize it. Nobody seemed to know who was driving it. It had a bumper sticker on it that said something about have you hugged your children today? And it also oddly enough, had a thing about don't get into vehicles with strangers or some kind of bumper sticker that said, don't go somewhere with strangers, which is kind of ironic. A few months later, investigators get another tip about a guy who lived in the area who I guess knew Randy. He was like, I guess, close acquaintances with Randy. The witnesses said that because there were flyers all over town of, you know, missing posters for Randy. And this person had allegedly, every time he looked at this poster, wherever he was, he was laughing at it, like maniacally, like, ah, <laughs> almost like a, you're never gonna find him kind of creepy thing. So they find out who this guy is. They bring him in for questioning. He says, I have absolutely nothing to do with this. I don't know if he explained why he was laughing at the flyers or not, but he did voluntarily take a polygraph test. He passed with flying colors, but you know, that means not much. But they couldn't find any physical evidence that he had any connection to what happened to Randy. He didn't own a van. He didn't drive a van like that. No one in his household drove a van like that. So he was pretty much just cleared as a suspect. Weird dude, but not the guy. Then police got a very significant break. Years later, authorities in Florida would reach out to the Sheriff's Department in Clare County, Michigan. They are asking and inquiring about a man named John Rodney McRae. John Rodney McRae had recently left or fled Florida in whatever capacity that may be. So this was immediately after he had become a suspect in the disappearance of three young boys. The young boys were Keith Fleming, Kip Hess, and Charles Collingwood. These were boys aged 12 to 19 years old. They fit the same type of description as Randy, same age range. They came from, all of them came from like low income houses. All of them seemed to always kind of be seeking advice from older people, that kind of thing. Like, so there is that kind of like, well, did these boys interact with their alleged potential kidnapper slash maybe murderer, maybe because he offered like life advice or I don't know what. But John Rodney McRae was linked to all three of these boys in Florida and now he seems to be gone. Well, John Rodney McRae, this wasn't his first issue with uh, young boys. He actually had been convicted of kidnapping and murdering another young boy in 1950 when John McRae was 15 years old. On September 9th, 1950, back in St. Clair Shores, Michigan, at the age of 15, he had brutally murdered eight-year-old Joseph Joey Housey. Was soon apprehended for this murder, and he was convicted of it and spent several decades in prison. He had spent decades in prison before he was released, and he was living back in the Clare County, Michigan area by the time Randy had gone missing back in 1987. At that time, Mr. McRae was a father himself. And what investigators learned now in 1997 was that Randy Lawfer would go to the home of John McRae on occasion because he was friends with Mr. McRae's son. However, for whatever reason, despite living just like a mile or two away from where Randy lived, and despite that connection, he, M Mr. McRae, never ever came up on the police's radar. They never, he was never a suspect back in 1987. I don't know why. They found out he absolutely drove a van that matched the description of the van he, that Randy was last seen in. They discovered where John McRae had been living at the time. He had this kind of larger property. He lived in a trailer with this big, you know, big farm property around it. Now at this point, somebody else owns it. That person is doing some work in 1997 or so. They unearth something from the ground that shocks them. It is a human skull. 
So they immediately alert the police. They have a big team come in. They do a very detailed dig of this area. Not only is it just a human skull, but they also find other human bones there. This is all part of one person's skeleton. They find this person is wearing clothing, which had evidence of blood on it. And they would determine that this individual, whoever it may be, was brutally murdered. This individual had been bound with ropes. They had been stabbed just so many times, and this was an extremely violent death. It, they did determine that this was the skeleton of a young boy, and so they were able to acquire dental records of Randy Lawfer, and they were finally able to confirm that the remains they found on John McRae's old property were the remains of 15-year-old Randy Lawfer. When police first found out about John McRae, they had gone to that property to question him, but they that's when they realized he wasn't living there. The owner at the time, and this is just before the skeleton was found, allowed them to search with cadaver dogs just to see. The cadaver dogs picked up nothing at all. They didn't find any uh, scent of human remains. What they later find out is that there was traces of goat urine kind of all over where the body was eventually found. There was goat urine in various places, and I guess this was a tactic used because goat urine would mask the smell of a decaying human body. But ultimately, it didn't really help because the body was found anyway. When all this comes out, a witness comes forward to states that John McRae was arguing with his son. I guess his son's name was Martin. This witness overheard an argument between John and his son where the son was saying, I don't want to dig this hole. Like there was this angry fight about digging a hole. The, the witness didn't realize at all at the time when he heard this argument that it was about digging the hole where they were going to put a body. And that's when they would piece together that John McRae may not have killed Randy on his own, that his son Martin may have actually helped him or at the very least helped him hide the body. Eventually, they would end up dropping charges against Martin McRae. They just didn't have enough evidence. He was a minor at the time and they believed he was just a secondary part of this that he didn't actually, was not involved in the actual murder itself. Martin McRae, later down the road, would be arrested several times and convicted a couple of times for having issues with minors now that he was an adult. Uh, this included molesting minor children. When they talked to John McRae, he seemed almost giddy that they caught him. He just seemed very... Like, yeah, like, ah, ah, you caught me. By the way, I forgot to mention, John McRae was actually, they found him living in Arizona, and that's where they arrested him. He was 63 years old at the time. But based on this interview they had with him, he, like I said, he seemed giddy, and they think that John McRae enjoyed every second of this murder. Like, he just loved, loved it. He loved that he did it. He was a genuine piece of human shit. Like, this guy is a monster. They had a lot of evidence against him. They now had, they knew the van he was driving that the witness spotted. They had the body, obviously, on the property where John McRae lived. They had that connection that Randy had gone to the McRae property often. There was just, there was a lot of evidence that he did this. And so he was found guilty at trial after the jury just deliberated for like two or three hours. And he would end up being convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Turns out life in prison for him was just three weeks. Because just three weeks into his imprisonment, he died of natural causes. The police in Florida had questioned him again before he died, obviously before he died, not afterwards, Mike, about the three missing boys. He wouldn't say what he knew. And then when he died, all hopes of that were gone. If John McRae was responsible for those three missing boys, which by all accounts, he probably was, they will never be able to know what he knows because he took those secrets to the grave. And he probably likes that a lot. Down in hell, he's probably laughing that he got away with that. That they'll never find those boys because he's dead. So you have three families now in Florida 
who don't get closure. They don't get answers. They don't get their kids back. They don't get to bury them properly. The only thing they can hope now is that just somehow, some way, kind of like how Randy's body was found, that they'll get lucky and find the body that way. And so hopefully that does come to fruition one day. But they will never get justice because their alleged, the boy's alleged killer is dead. And so now all they just want is their, their loved one's home. Randy Lawfer was this 15-year-old kid who went to this guy's property because he was friends with, their, with his son, didn't think anything of it. And then he was brutally murdered because he trusted this guy. He trusted this family. In the end, Randy Lawfer and his family got justice, but it didn't last very long. But with John McRae now rotting in the fires of hell, I guess you could say that Randy Lawfer and his family did get a different kind of justice, and it was the justice they all rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case, True Crime Aruni, Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, please subscribe to the channel, give this video a like. Follow me over on my TikTok pages if you want. The links are in the link tree in the description below where my merch store is also. You can find it there. We ship all over the world. And lastly, you can recommend a case to my email address. My email is listed below. Just send me the name of the case, where it happened and when it happened, and I'll add it to the list. I pick my cases at random, so I will cover that case eventually. I just can't tell you when. But that is it for this video. So we will see you guys tomorrow for the next story. All right. Ta-ta for now, true crime maroonies.